I'll call to order the regular <coughs> meeting of the Common Council of the City of Platteville for Tuesday, September 23rd, 2014, and we will start with roll call. Eileen Nichols? Here. Amy Seabolt Wilson? Here. Here. Mike Den? Here. Barbara Doss has been excused. Barbara Stockhausen? Here. Dick Bonin? Here. And Ken Killian? Here. First item tonight is a public hearing, but there are a couple of things that we need to note um, before we start that. One is that if you are here and you wish to speak on the public hearing question or if you wish to speak on some other item that's on the agenda, we do ask that you fill out this green sheet. It's on the table over there, and we would appreciate it if you would do it now, not <laughs> during the middle of our council meeting. So if there's anybody who does want to speak or if you just want to register in favor or opposed to something, you can do that as well. So I have the ones who have already been filled out. The other thing is that the um, changes in public transportation item, we have a, a council person who has asked to be excused for participating in that discussion because her work is related to the one portion of that. So if no one on the council objects, Amy C. Both Wilson will be excusing herself. Okay. Oh, yes. Now we will start with staff presentation. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, I'll start with uh, shared ride taxi hours on Sunday. Uh, Southwest Regional Planning Commission recently completed a study regarding the feasibility of combining the current shared ride taxi with the University of Wisconsin Platteville shuttle bus system. One of the results of that study was the request to increase shared ride taxi hours of operation on Sunday. This was supported in an email to Common Council um, in August and a petition uh, in March. Uh, currently, the shared ride taxi operates 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Wednesday, 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. Thursday through Saturday, and 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Sunday. Many riders have expressed their desire for extended hours on Sunday uh, for many different reasons. And this is for uh, a lot of different people but especially for homebound, hospitalized, or long-term care uh, facility uh, patients. Extending Sunday hours until 8 p.m. would accommodate the dinner hour and address a variety of needs of all citizens. Our local office manager for our shared ride taxi mentioned that Thursday night rides between 8 p.m. and 3 a.m. Are, are very few. If you wish to... Uh, pay for those extended hours, you could do so by reducing hours on Thursday. The regional planning study did not, I say again, did not look at cutting hours in order to fund extended hours on Sunday. I have statistics on, on ridership uh, on, on the Thursday nights. Uh, but based on the, the desires here, um, one of the things that I, I do want to mention is that if we approve this shared ride taxi on Sunday in and of itself without any other uh, actions, it would increase the local tax share of subsidy payments for the taxi by less than $2,000 per year. Currently, we uh, pay a little under $41,000 in local tax subsidy for our taxi system. So we're talking um, less than 5% additional money in order to fund a complete year of Sunday taxi hours, uh, additional seven hours every Sunday. So based on this, uh, staff would recommend approving a motion to budget an increase in service hours for shared ride taxi every Sunday in calendar year 2015 and uh, therefore the operating hours would be from 7 a.m. to th uh, to 8 p.m. on Sunday. If you wish to add to curtail operational hours on Thursday, uh, you, you may do so, but I don't know that that's, that that's uh, necessary at this time. 
that's uh, that's the first proposal. Do you want me to do the second one now or I later? think you should. I think as a council we can vote on them individually, but I think that because okay. they can be tied together in terms of possible financial situation. Yes, please. Okay. The second part of this is to discuss the shared ride taxi and UW Platteville shuttle bus study. Southwest Regional Planning Commission recently completed this study um, and the re what we have here is currently the shuttle is not eligible for federal or state funding subsidies because it's not sponsored by a municipality. Uh, currently the city provides as I said just under $41,000 in local tax dollars to support the shared ride taxi. Fares estimated at $75,000 for the year. Federal and state grants provide just under $164,000 for a total budget of just under $280,000. These federal and state grants comprise over half of the total budget. Currently, the university shuttle is 100% funded by student fees for a total budget of $150,000. If the funding formula stays the same by combining the two systems and keeping the fares and the city and university contributions at the same level, the federal and state grant could be increased to be as much as $382,000 uh, for a total budget of approximately $654,000. This this no increase in local tax support or local uh, student fee support scenario would allow expansion of hours and routes for both the taxi and a shuttle to serve the university and the city as a whole. Conversely, using the same funding formula, if you combine the two systems and keep the budgets and the service hours the same as they are now, uh, regional planning uh, projected a maximum of savings of about 48 percent of local funding. They assumed that the percentage would be the same, percentage savings would be the same. Uh, obviously there's also any number of scenarios where you could increase uh, the service hours slightly and also have some local savings. Um, under this same study uh, Whitewater, Stout, and Stevens Point, uh, and Stout in Menominee, uh, and uh, Stevens Point have a similar combined shuttle bus and taxi system that, are, that can serve as examples of ways to achieve this. Um, if this were to be uh, approved tonight, our next step would be to come up with an agreement intergovernmental agreement between the city of Platteville and the university and in those in that agreement we would have we would be negotiating and that would be our protection as a city to make sure that the city did not uh, fund for the university shuttle that the additional cost of the shuttle is provided by by the university's local match and by the federal and state dollars. Um, so my my assumption in going into an agreement would be that I would assume that there's no increase in the city and university contributions. If the council so chooses, they may direct staff to with some guidance on savings if that's if that's what you want do you want five percent ten percent whatever that could be part of your motion um, so at this point uh, staff would recommend approving a motion to accept the regional planning recommendation and to direct the staff to work with UW Platteville and Wisconsin DOT to combine the shared ride taxi in the University of Wisconsin Platteville shuttle bus into a combined public transit system. Howard, just one other matter for clarification. The contract with the taxi expires January 1, is that correct, of 2015? 
That's correct. Okay, so that's one of the reasons that's being brought forward this evening. Then we need to act on that, especially. Um, we ask questions. We can ask questions now, or if uh, the council oh, would allow, we have three people who would like to speak, and then we'll have a council discussion yeah. after these individuals oh, have the opportunity to speak. So. Um, first one, Rich Christensen, taxi hours on Sunday. If you would come to the microphone, Rich, and actually you also would like to talk about the shuttle bus study, so I can give you a little bit of extra time to talk about that as well. I thought they should really be uh, separate discussions. If you'd like to do it separately, that's fine. I assumed there was going to be really two different public hearings. Well, we can do one public hearing and still have two separate votes, so. Right, right. Okay. Okay, uh, Rich Christensen, uh, and I live at 10 South 3rd Street here in Platteville. And I'm gonna speak first about uh, increase in shared ride taxi hours on Sunday. I'm in favor of increasing the hours on Sundays for Platteville's taxi service. Let's give it a try and see how it goes. I think it will work out. I am wondering, however, why the staff note states that this item is one of the results of the study. The Common Council knew of the public's desire for additional hours on Sundays before the Southwestern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission feasibility study. In regard to Sunday hours, SWRPC didn't tell the Council anything it didn't already know. In fact, the Common Council can adjust taxi service hours whenever they feel it is appropriate, as they did last year. It's probably better for funding purposes to make changes with the beginning of a new year, but if necessary, they can make changes at other times. Since the Southwest Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission feasibility study has been introduced during, in the staff note for this public hearing, now might be a good time to ask a question. It is my understanding that an 80% DOT grant was awarded to the city of Platteville for the study. The staff note states that the additional hours on Sundays will increase the local tax share of subsidy payments by less than $2,000 a year. My question for the Common Council is, what was the total amount paid to Southwestern Wisconsin and Regional Planning Commission for the feasibility study, and what was the university's 10% share of that amount? Thank you. Thank you. The other well, there's one other person that would like to speak then on the shared ride shuttle bus study, and Ryan Hettinger? Yes. Hettinger. Yep. I hope I got that right. All right, you if are. you could give your uh, address, please, Ryan. Yes. Um, my address is 880 Union Street, apartment number two in Platteville. And I'm just coming to uh, kind of share my experiences with the uh, shuttle and just express um, that. As far as the university is concerned, SUFAC and this uh, student senate are already on board and they are in favor of the position as well um, to work with the city to make sure that it's a, um, a positive experience for everyone involved. And as a Platteville resident, I use the shuttle bus quite a bit um, on my way to school and on to work. So it really helps me um, be productive in both school and in the community as well as um, do my grocery shopping and I am very excited to see an expansion of it and um, to see it become a more um, a more positive experience uh, throughout Platteville for all residents involved thank you thank you <coughs> and Rich on the taxi shuttle bus study Uh, before I start, I would like to share some information with the Common Council. It's from Sunday's Wisconsin State Journal. It's from the newspaper's Week in Review. It is from uh, the Sunday, September 14th column. And it's about uh, the Green Bay Packers, so I think uh, you'll want to listen carefully. The heading is, Pack Comes Back, Transit Spending. The Green Bay Packers rally from an 18-point deficit in the second quarter to beat the New York Jets at Lambeau Field. The team and its three division rivals are all one and one. The Packers play the Lions in Detroit on Sunday. Also, local government officials are pushing lawmakers to address a projected $680 million deficit in the state transportation fund, 
put in existing projects and out. Oh, and I, I have an update. Uh, I'm sorry to say uh, the Packers lost to the Detroit, Detroit Lions on Sunday, and their season record is now one win and two losses. Okay, public hearing on the shared ride taxi UW Platteville shuttle bus study. I spoke at the August 12th Common Council meeting, and what I said was printed in the August 20th Platteville Journal. I think I can honestly say that after my comments, things happened that never would have happened otherwise. What I said got people's attention, and that was my hope. So, so what's next? Well, the city is being told by Southwestern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission that it should enter into a formal agreement with the university. SWRPC and the university are trying to rush the city into an agreement um, that they are calling a formal partnership. I'm just afraid that what it will really be is a pact with the devil. The Common Council does not have the information it needs to make an informed decision. The information given to the Council by SWRPC has been confusing and misleading. The Council has been overwhelmed by a lot of useless information. And important and helpful information has been hidden from the Council. I would guess the Common Council has 100 unanswered questions. At this time, I don't know how the Council can even think about entering into any type of agreement. I hope the Council will not put the city on the hook. I hope the Council will demand answers before it does anything. Make no mistake, Southwest Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission has been working for the university. Amy Seaboth Wilson works for the university. Their actions are disappointing, but are somewhat understandable. Not so understandable is Howard Crowfoot. My hope is that he is working behind the scenes, scenes with individual council members and is being honest and straightforward, but I don't know. Just last week, on Monday, September 15th, Southwest Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission gave a second presentation, about eight weeks after the first presentation. After the presentation, someone in the audience asked to see the feasibility study. Southwest Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission started making excuses. I'm pretty sure they were not going to provide the report or say where it was, but Seabolt Wilson from the back of the room spoke up and said the report was on the university's website. It seems SWRPC has been hiding it for some time. What can I say or what should I say about the feasibility study and report? I have not had much time to look at it, but I can say it is worse than I imagined. I hope the Common Council and the public get a chance to at least page through it. Right now, I could probably talk about 10 things that are in the report, but I'll mention only two. First, take a look at those 447 community members. SWRPC cited that number a few times when describing their outreach. What they didn't mention was the non-student numbers from that 447 and how they got them. You'll have to dig for that. Second, take a look at the Roundtree Commons numbers. Rules were broken when that dorm was built, and it was built where it shouldn't have been. You can bet that people made money off the way things were done. Now the thinking is, get public money for the student shuttle, whether needed or not. Don't get me wrong, if university students want the student shuttle and they're paying for it, fine, they can do what they want. The student shuttle has been in operation for two years. It has been available to everyone, but really only students use it. The actual ridership numbers for non-students are available, so why pay any attention to poorly done surveys or opinion polls? The shuttle buses should only be considered as serving the city if a significant number of non-students are riding them. If and when that happens, that would be the time to consider a combined system. To quote Amy Seaboth Wilson, this will only work if it served both the city and the university. Thank you. Those are all the statements from the public, so it is now time for council discussion. And uh, you can make comments about the shared ride taxi hours on Sunday first if you'd like. Maybe we'll address that one first and then we can go on to the shuttle. Any comments on the request to increase the shared ride taxi hours on Sunday? I see no problem with that whatsoever. It's basically um, 
a very small amount of money to do that. I believe Howard quotes that it's about um, $2,000. I looked at the cost. Uh, it cost us $24.99 an hour for our, with our contract for our taxi. And if you do the math on seven hours, it's not much of an increase to increase for seven hours. I think it's a good idea, and I think we should go forward with it. Anyone else on the shared ride? I think it's a good idea. All right. Barbara Dick? I go along with that. Sure. Um, the question was brought up about changing the hours on Thursday night to accommodate the seven hours on Sunday. Personally, I would not be in favor of that. I think that having that available on, the, on that particular evening does allow people, obviously young people as well as um, in disabled people in the report, it showed that there were disabled people that also used the taxi in the evening. So I would, I would prefer to keep that the same. So I would also. So I having discussed that, we need a motion just on the shared ride taxi hours on Sunday. Do we want to increase that? I'll make a motion that we do. Oh, I'm sorry. We have I need to close uh, public hearing and um, later. You know, you're right. Oh, we can't do that in public. Right, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. So then, I'm sorry. Let's just discuss the shared ride taxi UW Platteville shuttle bus study then, and then we'll do the close the public hearing and make the motions. I asked some questions yep. about the uh, shuttle with the folks that did the survey, and the number I got was somewhere in the neighborhood, they gave me a specific number and I can't remember it right now, but it's a neighborhood of 300 plus with a stu out of that 400 and whatever were students. I think there was only 90 some that were actually uh, residents or elderly in Platteville to answer your question. My issue is um, if you, when you looked at all of the scheduled times and the number of people that rode the Platteville taxi, a lot of them were college students. So if you increase the usage of the shuttle, and I think the biggest complaints were the shuttle doesn't travel um, quick enough. There's, the, there's too many layovers, you have to wait too long for it, and it doesn't have enough stops. Okay, if you increased all this for the benefit of the students, and if they used it more, you're gonna take away from our taxi service. Now, those kids do use it a lot. So then you're gonna be taking revenue away from the city of Platteville. So I don't see a benefit to get in b into an agreement with the university for the shuttle. Uh, my question to you, Howard, is if there's all this extra funding from state money, is that gonna eliminate the 40-some thousand that we pay out of taxpayer money then, so we won't have to spend that? So it's all gonna be funding if we have this agreement? The, uh, we, we can't eliminate completely the, uh, the local share uh, because of DOT regulations, the way that they calculate their formulas. However, under the, uh, under the Southwest Regional Planning Study, if you assume no increases in service hours or anything like that, the city and the university could reduce their local share by as much as 48%. So what are we talking in dollars and cents? We spend what forty thousand something out of taxpayer money right now. So what yeah, would we be spending? Just under forty-one thousand. So forty-eight percent of that would would be uh, a savings of oh I don't know I'd have to calculate it out. It'd be somewhere in the neighborhood of eighteen to nineteen thousand dollars. So so we would be instead of spending forty forty-one thousand, we would be spending in the neighborhood of twenty-one twenty-two thousand dollars okay. for the same for the same level of service that we have right now. What I look when I looked at the number of riderships that were students and what the dollar value would be if you lost a large proportion of that because you had shuttle access because they would have their card just to scan because they've already prepaid that they wouldn't have to spend that it would probably be a wash. So the money that we would lose versus the money that we don't have to pay out would be probably, uh, if we kept it, the monies would be the same that we're doing right now with, uh, with the number of uh, riderships that we have with the university. So I don't really see a big benefit for the city by doing this. Thank you. Other comments? Well, my concern is uh, what's gonna happen to the taxi? Will we have taxi service 
as good or better than we have now? If you increase the shuttle, will the will the um, people will the public use it? And I saw about a month ago an example of a taxi coming up to a local uh, medical facility and dropping the patient off. Now, what I would want that type of service to continue. So that's my concern. If we increase the shuttle, is that going to affect the taxi as far as the service we finally get? I think it would be more difficult for elderly to climb in and out of a bus like that than it is the comfort of a vehicle. I did ask a question about whether or not the um, shuttle could accommodate handicapped individuals, and the answer is yes. That's required at the university as well, and so that if you were using a walker, let's say, and, and you needed to get onto the bus, you could do that. I believe a wheelchair as well, so. You do need the privacy that, issue, though. Yeah. That, well, I think in answer to Ken's question, and Howard, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the tax hours would remain the same. The service would remain the same. So I yes. don't think that it would be negatively impacting this, the taxi in terms of the hours of service. The same people could call the taxi and expect to have it available if it was available when they needed to use it. Correct. That, that's the whole intent uh, is to offer different choices and different opportunities for more people here in the city of Platteville, not just students. Uh, those people who want to use the convenience of point-to-point, door-to-door uh, service at, at a smaller, at a little bit of a premium cost, they would still call for the taxi and, and they would be able to do that. If they, if they uh, were looking for a cost savings method of transit, uh, they would, you know, walk a certain distance to a bus stop, get on, get on a shuttle bus, and then maybe have to walk additionally at the end of, after a bus stop to get to their final destination. Some people would want to do that. Um, you know, the, the whole idea here is to offer choices and opportunities for people who, who may want or who may want to use those choices. Um, you know, as we've said before, if this is not in the interests of the citizens of Platteville, that, then that's fine. But to me, the interests of the citizens include additional opportunities to get uh, federal and state tax money to help um, subsidize the public transit here within the city. Howard, what happens if the subsidies um, some of them go away if we enter into an agreement. Are we going to have to come up with a difference to help pay for our part of it? Under all DOT agreements that we've had since the time that I've been here, it's written into the DOT agreement that says that if, if the costs are, uh, if the costs exceed what's been previously agreed to, or if the state and federal government bows out, the city agrees to fund everything. Well, so far in the 17 years that I've been here, none of that has happened. Um, so that wouldn't change. Um, okay, so there is a possibility then, since uh, there is a great transportation deficit in the state of Wisconsin that we just found out about, we could end up paying for part of the shuttle, realistically. Not saying it's going to happen, but it could. There's still the local share that's, uh, that's provided by the university. My feeling is that any shortcoming or shortfall in state or federal money would be shared proportionately by the city and the university uh, if, if that were to occur. I don't see why we couldn't put that into an agreement where uh, the university would pay the additional costs uh, that would be attributable to the shuttle. The only the other concern that I have is what I just mentioned about the uh, percentage of people using it. Here in one particular uh, September through, uh, I believe, December, 51.4% of the ridership were 
uh, university students. You've reduced that considerably, and you might affect the taxi itself in Platteville because they may have to increase their share, their prices to maintain the income that they need. So that, that's one thing that concerns me. Thank you. My, um, I do have a comment about your concern about uh, the cost. Uh, if you read that question, would you be willing to purchase a monthly pass for unlimited use of the shuttle and shared ride service? Well, obviously that'll lock in the price. The elderly say 60% yes. Now Platteville residents say no. I suspect they don't use the shuttle service, though I didn't find that section in here right now. Um, my son rode the taxi service for six years, every week, every day. Um, and I bought it, the package, every month, and found it to be the best way to lock in the price and get good service. So I think that one thing we should really look at or think about is the fact that you can buy a pass for both services. Unlimited use of the shuttle and the shared ride service. I mean, so you buy, I don't know what the cost is gonna be, but after the grants, after all the formulas are put together and uh, the members of the community that use this, and I suspect you can even buy it on the shuttle or in the taxi, you're going to save a lot of money just in buying the pass. It's so much easier to just hand over a piece of paper and have them scan it than it is to dig in your pocket to find cash uh, every time you get on these uh, vehicles. And the other part of it is I was a bus driver for over five years had to transport people in wheelchairs, people that couldn't get an up and off the stool, getting in that first. And I found that the drivers are licensed. They have to know how to drive a vehicle. They have to know how to do it correctly without injury uh, to the ridership. And, uh, or in that case, the other drivers on the street. So I think it, just in that area alone, it's a plus as far as your comment, Mike. So okay, one thing I with, go for this. I'm sorry, Barb. One thing with the 60%, that's only 60%, which amounts to about 30-some people, 30, maybe 40 people at the most in that survey. So it sounds like a high percentage, but it's the percentage, there are only 90-some people that were surveyed along those groups. We did receive, or at least some council members, I, I think all council members did receive an email from a, a business owner downtown encouraging the um, combination of the taxi and shuttle simply because she felt that it would be a way for more people to get downtown and other places around the community and it would mean less congestion in terms of cars and things like that. And her comment was sometimes people drive rather fast on Main Street and if you cut down the number of cars that might be a little safer so that was one comment. I also had a comment from a person who normally walks everywhere but said that if the taxi's not available but if the shuttle then would be available she would be willing to walk to the bus stop to go for example to the university or to a shopping site and then still get off of the bus and walk home because she's used to walking, but at least in the colder weather, she would have the option then of mm -hmm. using the bus and getting a little closer to her home. So she was in favor of it. Um, I think that the other thing I wanted to ask Howard again is that the contract is for, it's a, basically a three-year bid as I understand it, but then it, it's a yearly mm -hmm. contract, is that correct? The way that we've done these contracts and the way that DOT structures them for us is they would be, it would be a one-year contract with the option of four one-year extensions. What we have done in the past is we have automatically extended uh, those, those taxi contracts for those additional four years. So it would, it, seems like a five-year contract, but legally it's a one-year contract at a time, and if the city decides that it 
does not like the the service that it's getting or if there's some other problem then at you know then the city could go through the proposal process all over again you know just give notice and say we're not renewing the contract we're going to go for a for a proposal uh, and that would be the same way that we would enter into a contract with a bus provider so for me a one-year trial seems like something that would be worth considering and that basically is what we could do and we would have a developers agreement which the council would have to approve and so it would come back to the council for an approval as far as the any agreement between the city and the university is there any other council discussion my question is when will this be implemented January 1 I'm sorry I can't find it here right now oh uh, my intent would be um, we would have to work it out with the university the the issue here is that the university's current shuttle bus contract goes through the end of the the current school year so we would have to adjust the shuttle bus to take over at the end of the school year um, so the bus and the taxi would be on slightly different cycles so there'll be two negotiating opportunities there one with the taxi in January and one with the shuttle and the taxi in June sounds like somewhere like that yes thank you Any other council discussion Hearing none, is there a motion to close the public hearing? I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second, and we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Den? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Common Council action first on the increase in the shared ride uh, taxi hours on Sunday. I'll make a motion that we increase the time that the taxi is used on Sundays. Second to the motion. We have a motion and a second, and we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Den? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. And a motion then on the shared ride taxi, UW Platteville shuttle bus. Well, I move that we accept, but I can't find the correct reading here. So I accept, I move that we accept the proposal for combining the taxi service and the shuttle service. Um, I can read it, Barb, since okay, you can't find you. it on your um, computer. I've been looking at these. A motion to accept Southwest Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission recommendation and direct staff to work with UW Platteville and Wisconsin DOT to combine the shared ride taxi and UW Platteville shuttle bus into a combined public transit system. Do we have a second to that motion? I, I would second it if it. Uh, would include it we would review at the end of one year I'll agree to that all right we have a motion and a second Jan did you get that yes okay I we'll vote Nichols yes Den. yes Stackhausen yes Bonin yes with a question <laughs> Killian uh, yes. Motion carries. Can I have you my can, question? You can certainly ask the question. I'm sorry, Dick. If, you, if I cut you off, I didn't mean to. Uh, is there a possibility we can do this? Would this be the same as what he amendment he made as a trial basis instead of looking at it? Well, a review in one year is what Ken, Ken said. Yeah. yeah. Right, be yeah. on the same order. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I All think right. that accomplishes and the same thing. No question. All right. Next item: a special presentation on the 2015 budget presented to be presented by the city manager. Thank you. <clears throat> this evening, before you, you'll find a copy of the draft budget proposal. I'm going to uh, read a few snippets from the cover letter. Uh, you'll all notice that you have two copies of the cover letter within your document. 
Uh, everybody makes mistakes, and I think that was a, a, a copying error. So if you want to rip one of those copies out, you're welcome to do so. With this letter, uh, you'll find a copy of the 2015 City of Platteville proposed executive budget. A few of the key points of the budget uh, are general fund. Um, <clears throat> the City of Platteville is experiencing significant growth. The city's equalized valuation went up close to $67 million in 2014, bringing the city's total value to $607,223,200. million, $26 million of that was in new construction. So our city is growing substantially. Uh, what this will add is $181,000 in additional tax revenue to the city of Platteville without increasing tax rates. The 2015 operating budget totals $8,342,440. This is a 2.7% increase from last year. Key changes within the budget include a 1.5% salary increase for all staff over 20 hours. I included two new staff positions, both of which are part-time staffing positions. One is a part-time senior center attendant, and one is a part-time building inspector. The reduction of one department head position as of June 1st, 2015, due to retirement. Uh, we also included higher costs in the budget for information technology, uh, as well as ha increased health insurance costs. Uh, we don't have final numbers on, on our health insurance yet, but uh, we do anticipate uh, an increase again this year. Uh, as it relates to the city's debt, in 2015, the city will be paying off $1,090,000 in principal and $442,000 in interest. Currently, the city is at 59.15% of our state's borrowing capacity, and according to our internal policy, we're at 84.5%. You'll see that number has decreased substantially because our value of our city has gone up substantially. Uh, the capital improvement plan is being put into the budget, and previously the city council had approved a $2.4 million capital improvement plan for 2015 to 2019. However, since then, I'm proposing a few changes. Uh, we've reduced and removed the election voting machines for 52,000. Uh, those are no longer needed in this calendar year. Uh, we've added funding for the library block project, as well as for the PCA trail um, MPO project that we've discussed. Um, the last note is as a result of those changes, we are borrowing funds for a portion of our CIP budget. Uh, we will be 8% short, so we'll have to borrow 8% of our capital improvement projects plan, at least under this proposal. Uh, lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about our TIF districts. Uh, the City of Platteville has several tax increment district partnerships with our other taxing jurisdictions that will continue into 2015. The Library Block Project is expected to make substantial impacts to TIF District Number 7. Uh, in 2015, we're also looking for an industrial park expansion in TIF District Number 6, uh, funded with a substantial grant from the federal government. Uh, and then the river tree, excuse me, the round tree river branch trail is going to be improved substantially. Uh, and some of the funding from that will come from TIF district number five uh, in 2015. Um, you'll also note that uh, I've asked department heads to come to the city council meeting on October 6th at 5 p.m. Uh, we'll be meeting in this room and we'll talk about this budget proposal. And that'll be the beginning of our annual budget review process. Um, I would specifically like to thank Valerie Martin and Dwayne Borgen and the finance department staff for helping to assemble this budget, uh, as well as every department head that had to uh, submit and go through a grueling budget process with the city manager. Uh, together, we make an excellent team, and we are very proud to be part of Platteville. At this time, the council typically will take a few weeks to review the budget proposal, and we will discuss it on October 6th. 
Uh, before that, does anyone have any questions right off the bat? I have a question for you, Larry. Yep. When will this $181,024 show up as actual dollars and cents in city coffers? 2015. It'll all be there in 2015. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, thank all right. you. All right, remember the meeting on October 6th, 5 p.m. Next item is consideration of the consent calendar. The following items may be approved on a single motion and vote due to their routine nature of previous discussion. Please indicate to the council president if you would prefer a separate discussion and action. Um, Councilor Stockhausen does want to note two things if you want to note those now, Barb. Yes, uh, in the minutes um, that is documented in your package, it says that Platteville Common Council proceedings, it lists it September 8th, 2014. It should say September 9th, 2014. And then on the first paragraph at the second page in uh, line six, my name needs an N listed. Okay, so. Stockhouse, but Stockhouse N. So okay. I'd like those two changes in the minutes. So I will read off the rest and then with the motion if. You Thank would please you. include that. Um, so we have the minutes of the 9-9 regular council meeting, payment of bills, appointments to boards and commissions, and Mary Miller, I'm appointing her to the Board of Appeals. She, it's a reappointment. She took a partial term. Licenses, we have a change of agent for Walgreens, <coughs> excuse me, company in Deerfield. Uh, Jared Baker is the agent for the premises at 675 South Water Street. And in your packet, there's a list of one year and two year operator's licenses. Under permits, we have a request for the UW Platteville Homecoming Parade on October 11th, 2014. A Family Advocates Inc. Walk for Domestic Violence Awareness Week on October 21st, 2014. There's also Resolution 1424, application for exemption from the levy of any county library tax. This is something the council does annually. Resolution 1425, proclaiming October 2014 as United Nations Month, and I know we've done that in the past as well. And finally, and all those people out there who want to trick or treat, the Halloween trick or treat hours are Friday, October 31st from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Is there a motion on the consent calendar? I so move we accept the consent calendar as read. With the changes? With the, yeah, okay. as the mm -hmm. changes. To the minutes, yep. Is there a second? I second. I have a motion and a second. We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Seaboth Wilson? Yes. Den? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, citizens' comments, observations, and petitions. I don't have anyone who has signed up. The, the one that I have here is for an action item later. So any council members have anything, any announcements or anything about upcoming events? All right. Seeing none, we'll go on to the reports that are in your packet. Committee reports include the Airport Commission, Dawes is not present, Plan Commission, Nichols and Dan. I don't have anything to add. We're discussing a lot of that this evening. Water and Sewer Commission, Killian, Stockhausen, or Bonin? No addition. Okay. <laughs> Historic Preservation Commission, Killian? No addition. Redevelopment Authority, Dawes is not present this evening, library board, um, nothing to add at this point, the minutes were in the packet. Board of Zoning Appeals, Den? Nothing to add. Okay. Other reports included in the packet are the building inspector's report and department progress reports. Are there any questions or comments on any of those? All right, seeing none, we'll go on to the first action item, which is uh, contracted 2014-2016 Audit, auditing services, and I think Dwayne is going to, or Valerie, one of you is going to, Dwayne? Uh, yes, um, <coughs> we received three uh, audit proposals uh, from uh, ID Bailey LLP, Johnson Block and Company Incorporated, and Whipfle LLP. Um, after reviewing the references and experience of the auditing firms uh, for auditing Wisconsin municipalities, uh, well, staff recommends that we uh, hire uh, Johnson Block to do the auditing for the next three years. Questions from council people? No 
questions or comments from anyone? Then is there a motion? I move that we accept the auditing proposal from Johnson Block and Company for doing the auditing services for 2014 and 2016. I second it. I have a motion and a second and we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Seaboth Wilson? Yes. Dan? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Next item, Resolution 1426, a conditional use permit for home occupation at 200 Jewett Street. Joe. Yes, this is a request for a home occupation. It's considered an intensive home occupation. There are uh, ordinance, uh, so that does require approval of condition use permit. <coughs> Uh, the applicant would like to operate a massage therapy business out of her residence at that location. Uh, she would be the only employee of that business. Uh, the proposed hours of operation would be Monday and Tuesdays 9 to 6, Wednesdays and Thursdays 9 to 8 to 30, Friday 9 to 3, Saturday 9 to 2. Um, she does have parking available in her driveway. There are no physical changes proposed uh, to the property to accommodate um, that business. Um, the Planning Commission did consider this request at their September meeting and did recommend approval and staff would also recommend approval of the massage theory business as proposed. Any questions? Questions anyone? I make a motion to accept the staff's proposal. I second. I have a motion and a second and we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Seaboth Wilson? Yes. Dan? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Next item, resolution 1427, a conditional use permit for home occupation at 410 West Madison Street. Okay, yes, this is also a request to operate a, a home business, uh, 410 West Madison Street. Um, in this case, the business would be the repair and refurnishing uh, of furniture and also the sale of firewood from that location, which is also the applicant's um, residence. Um, this has been a business that actually has been ongoing for several years, uh, in particular the furniture and refinishing uh, quite a few years. Um, staff did recently require or re receive a, a call from some neighbors with some concerns about the appearance of the property, so that um, got us involved and um, realized that a, approval was needed for this based on the, the fact primarily that people, clients come and go to the property, that's one of the triggers. Um, so based on some of the concerns that were uh, raised, um, the, the Planning Commission took a look at this and um, basically came up with a recommendation for approval but with some conditions. Uh, the first condition would be that the storage of the furniture and related equipment shall be maintained inside the garage or the house. Uh, the second condition, the splitting storage and display of firewood shall be limited to the applicant's property and only within the side and rear yards as defined by the zoning ordinance. And the location of the firewood shall be brought into compliance with the above location restrictions prior to June 1st, 2015. Um, if you've looked at the property, one of the location issues was, it appears that the firewood is encroached onto the property to the west, which is a stone cottage. So that would have to be brought back onto the property and it, currently the firewood does extend into the street yard of the property, meaning it's closer to the street than the, the structure, the house. So that would also have to be essentially moved back. And the intent of the, the June 1st deadline is as the firewood is sold, that would get rid of the, pro, the, the firewood that's in the wrong location. And then going forward, um, any future fire would have to be maintained in the side and rear yard. Uh, the storage of the, the furniture and so forth uh, the discussion was basically that the, some of the finishing work could be done in the driveway as it currently is, but after at night and after he's done working on it, it would have to be maintained inside the garage or inside the house itself. Um, so those were the conditions that the Planning Commission recommended. Um, staff would concur with that recommendation. Are there any questions? Make a motion to accept the staff's along with the Planning Commission's proposal. I second. I uh, have a couple questions. I have always thought that uh, intensive uh, home occupation had to be within the dwelling. So I've talked to Joe Carroll about this and uh, um, 
I'd like to hear your comment uh, in relation to the code because, uh, first of all, for customary home occupation under 22.06, it says it has to be within the enclosed area of the dwelling unit or the garage. Then going to intensive home occupation, which is what this one is for the, uh, the wood uh, sale, uh, intensive says that, um, that these intensive home occupations are conditional use in all residential districts. They are subject to the, all the requirements for home occupation. And so my question is, um, it seems to me that the code is being bent here, I'll use that word, bent, to uh, allow this to take place because it is not within the structure within the dwelling. And then uh, if I look at another page, it says home occupation intense is page 134. It says that uh, a business, profession, trade, or employment conducted in a person's dwelling. So Joe, I think you need to Please tell me how you can justify this as being uh, a home occupation when it's not being conducted in a home. Um, well, the, the difficulty in this particular case of making that distinction is because the, the applicant as a homeowner is allowed to have firewood in his property, is allowed to split firewood on his property for his own personal use. So how would you make a distinction between which particular piece of firewood is for the business and which particular piece of firewood is for sale? That's a pretty fine line to make a distinction. So I took the approach that basically we have certain requirements that are home occupation they're allowed to do without any type of approval. Anything above and beyond that requires approval of the council after review of the plan commission. So in this particular case, some of those activities are taking place outside the structure, which is a trigger for the additional approval that is required. So I, I don't think it's possible to say he can't have firewood in his property because he is allowed to have firewood in his property just like you have firewood on your property. Well, I'm that's not disputing like that. Right, so that's part of this, the issue. I'm just talking about the sale. Well, so they can walk in the garage and the person can hand them the money and they're in compliance. I'm just talking about it, the firewood being for sale and it's outside the dwelling. I mean, I, I grew up with um, <coughs> burning the firewood and we had a structure in which to put, a building in which to put the firewood, but this property is too small for a structure. Who's supposed True. to have the structure? Pardon? Who's supposed to have the structure? Because I think I'm not specifying any structure. I'm just giving an example that we had enough space that we could have a building. And this property at 410 Madison doesn't have enough space for a building. Right. And under our, our regulations, we do not require a structure for the storage of firewood. That's right. Well, uh, some other things that uh, bother me on this is... Um, the height of the stack wood, um, I think it should be at the most six feet because one, it's a safety factor as far as falling over on people. Uh, it's next to the stone cottage so that uh, there are children there and uh, they might uh, possibly get hurt by getting too close to the fire firewood. Another thing I think is um, if you stack it so high, it makes the place look like a, a fort. Um, so I would like to, to um, amend the motion to read that the height be limited to six feet, no greater than six feet. This is the height that we have for a wooden fence or a fence. We would need a second to that motion. Um, may I give some information to the amendment of a motion, though? If you amend a motion, the person making the motion doesn't want to accept the amendment, then he does not have to. That's true. Just so everybody's aware of that. 
So we have a, an amendment, but no second. We do have um, individuals who have asked to speak on this, so before we vote, I would like to allow uh, these means. individuals to speak. Um, Roger Steinhoff. Hi, my name is Roger Steinhoff and I live at 415 West Madison Street, which is right across the street from this residence. And uh, irregardless, I guess, of whether you pass the uh, proposal or not, uh, I would like to speak on the chronic um, mess, I guess, that I get to look at it pretty much every day. So uh, I guess uh, I need to know a couple of things. How this is going to be regulated, or who is going to be in charge of regulating this, which one of you are going to be in, in charge of that, I guess, and uh, who I go to if something like this continues. I'll let Joe answer that. Yeah, that, that, that would either be the, the building inspector, Rick Renneker, or myself. You can contact either one of us. Okay. Um, Roger, would you speak into the microphone? Okay. I, I just wondered who was going to be, who the person was that I needed to contact if, if I needed to, to uh, get someone to look at it again. Mm -hmm. Have you and contacted the homeowner and the business owner? And reviewed what your concern is. I mean, you have you walked across the street and have a conversation with the, the business owner and the homeowner. I have I have talked to him before, but not necessarily approached him because of it. But there's a, been um, some comments before about. Um, The mess, I guess. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Steinhoff did provide photos, which they've asked me to share with the council, which I'm now doing. It has been kind of a chronic problem. Do you go around town and inspect other properties? Since we live in a kind of a unique town that... Oh yeah, there's other properties like, that are a mess. And you've contacted the city about that? No, I have not. Any other questions? Otherwise, Beth, would you also like to speak? Or? Hi, I'm Beth Steinoff, and I live at 415 West Madison Street. And Barb, the picture you have there in front of you right now is what I see out my kitchen window every single day I take a look out. Mm -hmm. And it is, I, I'm retired. I spend most of my time making my house pretty, flowers, lawn, everything. And Larry was talking about the value of the city a while ago. The value of my home is in jeopardy because of living in a place like that, if I was to want to sell my house, people are going to offer me less money because of this that's right across the street. And I think if any of you had this across from you, you'd feel this way. We are for Terry to get his permits. We just want someone to have him clean up not only the yard, but what's there in front of the garage some of those things have been there for years. So that's basically our point. If you would think of that as yourself, as your property value is going down, where Larry says our city is going up in value, but ours is going down, 
at our age, a lot of our wealth is because of our home, tied up in that. As I look around, some of you are the same age. So if that was you, and I don't think that it would take very much for it just to become a neater place. I have talked to the neighbors, they're not here. And this isn't just because of this issue. It's been over the years and every single one of them has complained about this mess over there. So I guess that's all I wanna say. Okay, thank you for coming and I, I think that um, Joe, it would be the resource for you, or Rick. Can, may I ask Joe a question? Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like, and you, you articulated that well, that there's two separate issues, right? So um, the business is one issue, and then the ability to keep the house in order is a separate issue. <coughs> I'm not always completely clear on where that line's drawn with building inspection and um, what the responsibility of property owners for keeping their yard in decent order. I personally have gotten a warning before for having something on the curb longer than it should have been. So I'm wondering if this property has had that happen before and why if why or why not have we been dealing with it? Um, I don't know for sure if this has been an issue that's been raised to city staff in the past. I know when I did uh, the recent property maintenance inspections this summer, I didn't address this property because I knew this issue was coming before the council and I knew some of those items were business related. So I was waiting until this rules through its process but going forward i mean we'll keep an eye on this property as we move forward and i'll i'll have a meeting with the uh, property owner to make sure he's understanding what's what's an issue and what isn't an issue from a code standpoint okay so basically every property should be up to code no matter what at all times so if this property looks is not up to code at this point they could be cited well, he would be, he wouldn't be cited he initially. He would be notified just like anybody else what the issues were and given an opportunity to make corrections. And most of the times the corrections are made when people are made aware of the issue. Citation is kind of a last resort in most cases. So part of a motion, maybe if we could amend it, could be to bring your house up to code. Would that be the correct way to word that? Well, I think I would prefer not to, to motion, combine those two issues because, as was mentioned, some of the issues that are raised have, are not directly related to the business that is being requested. In other words, even if you denied the business, he would still have to comply with the other codes. So I would prefer not to mix those two together. It would be my preference, but that's up to the council. I'm a little confused. I'm sorry. I'm just going to take that for a second longer that I realize the wood piles are a code issue or like that's what we're here talking about today. But if there's other separate issues, he should have been already received a warning for that, right? If they are truly separate issues. If we were aware of them, yes. Okay. So like going tomorrow, basically the building inspector could go take a look at it and cite, offer a warning if it truly is not up to code. Correct. Okay. Okay, and, and I agree that it is two separate issues. This is a request for uh, the home occupation. The neighbors have indicated they're not opposed to the home occupation, but they would like to have some relief from what they consider to be the other items in the, on the property that are, uh, need to be probably removed or whatever the building inspector and community planning development um, department comes up with. So, yes, Ken. As I understand this now, um, he can pile wood as high as his house, and he can fill the entire rear yard and side yard. Is that correct, Joe? Yes. Okay. All right, we're going to vote on this one. Can you repeat the motion? There, uh, repeat the motion, please. Oh. Well, the motion is to... Um, Recommend approval with the conditions that are you, the staff conditions. The storage of the furniture and related equipment shall be maintained inside the garage or house. 
the splitting storage and display of firewood shall be limited to the applicant's property and only within the side and rear yards as defined by the zoning ordinance and the location of the firewood shall be brought into compliance with the above location restrictions prior to June 1st, 2015. Everything should be in the, the resolution, so you simply have to make the motion to approve the resolution. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> motion to approve resolution number 1427, Please approving the conditional use permit. But the plan commission recommendation, so. Right. All right. That's the plan. Full vote. Nichols? Yes. Seaboth Wilson? Yes. Den? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? No. Motion carries. Next item, sign approval for a bed and breakfast at 130 North Hickory Street. Okay, uh, the property at 130 North Hickory Street is a bed and breakfast. Uh, she currently has a sign uh, on her front porch um, that is not easily visible from the street. Um, so she would like to have an additional sign installed in the yard. Um, it'll be in the front yard just north of her private sidewalk uh, on the property. The exact location will be pending the a location in case there's any utilities that they have to be concerned with. Uh, but it'll be five feet from the public sidewalk uh, on that property. Um, there was a, a, a drawing of the sign provided previously um, but the reason that there is a provision in the ordinance that uh, allows a freestanding sign but it requires review of the plan commission and approval by the council so that is the reason it's coming before you uh, otherwise without that approval she's limited to the sign on the, the structure itself uh, the plan commission did consider this request and recommended approval and staff also recommends approval any questions uh, no offense, Arlene, but based on the situation with uh, Mr. Polar, we I received a complaint on the front lawn maintain, maintenance. Do you have plans for that so that the house will uh, the sign will be more visible to the street? Because if you look at the picture, um, Ar your excuse, excuse me, excuse me, Barb. Arlene, would you come? To Sorry. The Identify yourself so that we have it for our record. Is this 130 North Hickory Street? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you consider this a natural lawn? Yes. It's a garden. It's a natural garden. It's native plants. These are allowable in Plotville. I'm just quoting a uh, question that came up to me uh, by another resident of the city. Have him call me. Well, and that's true. I'm simply stating what was told to me as a yeah. council member. Sure. All right, are there any questions on the request to have a sign? Otherwise, we need a motion on that question. I have one more question. Yes. How high is that sign going to be above your native plants so that it's useful? I, I'm not putting it up, so I don't know what he's going to do. I mean, it's, it's not going to be up in the sky. To, I mean, we're probably going to clear off some of that area so it will be uh, more visible. But we don't know exactly where it's going to be because there is electrical things going through that. And, and not electrical, but... Um, uh, uh, some things that needs to have uh, approval to where we or where, what we can't where we can't put it. Is this going to be lit? No. I believe the request says less less than six feet tall. Yeah. Yep. It's the height of the sign, um, about halfway through the page. Sorry. Sorry. Any other questions? There a motion. I move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. I will vote. Nichols? Yes. Seaboth Wilson? Yes. Den? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. <coughs> Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Final plat approval for Platteville Industry Park. 
Yeah, this is the uh, uh, final plat for the next phase of the uh, industry park. It's a property we purchased uh, recently, uh, just under 40 acres uh, between Eastside Road and Phillips Road. Um, the plat will divide the lot or the property into nine lots, uh, ranging in size from 1.7 acres to 7.5 acres. It includes uh, extension of Vision Drive from Eastside Road to Phillips Road and also at least provide some outlots to allow for future extension of Phillips Road to the south and also Evergreen Road to the west. Um, there are also some easements provided and some um, access restrictions, vehicular access restrictions from some of those lots to East Side Road. Um, this does meet the requirements or is substantially in compliance with the preliminary plat, which was already approved and the Planning Commission recommended approval at their meeting and staff also recommends approval. Any questions? Any questions? Otherwise, a motion is in order. I'll make a motion that we accept the final plat for Platteville Industry Park 7. Second. I have a motion and a second. We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Seabolt Wilson? Yes. Den? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Next item, demolition of houses at 85 North Water Street, 160 East Mineral Street, and 222 North Elm Street. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask for a uh, staff fine. report. <laughs> fine. Um, I solicited bids from three firms. Two responded. Uh, you see the results here. Um, bids can be uh, awarded singly or together as the council desires for each of these three houses. Uh, recently, there was some uh, discussion about uh, a nonprofit organization coming in to do some salvaging operation, and uh, Rural Excavating said that as long as, uh, as they do it before, uh, before they sched they're scheduled to come in in late October, early November, to do the demolition uh, that wouldn't change their bids at all. Um, so uh, we're working with the nonprofit to see if, if they do in fact want to salvage anything from any of the houses that you may approve for demolition. Uh, staff recommends demolition of all three and uh, awarding the bid to uh, rural excavating. Any questions? Well, I move that we accept the demolition of houses at 85 North Water, 160 East Mineral, and 222 North Elm, and award this contract to Rural Excavating for a total price of 25000 Back up. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Seabolt Wilson? Yes. Den? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Under information and discussion, first one is the speed limit changes on business 151. <clears throat> uh, enclosed in your packet is a draft uh, ordinance to make changes to business 151. Um, after discussions with Council Member Stockhausen, uh, the attached proposal was drafted in an effort to slow vehicular traffic in and around the busier business corridor in an intersection on Business 151, uh, specifically where the four lanes become two lanes. Uh, we're looking at reducing the speed from 40 down to 35, and then where those two lanes go down the bottom of the hill and cross Valley Street, at that point it would become 25 and stay at 25 miles an hour all the way across to the Chamber of Commerce and then speed back up. So we're taking an area that was 40, reducing it to 35, taking an area that was 30 and reducing it to 25 under this proposal. I don't Question. know if. Okay, the, the, the wording here is, gives me the idea that you're talking about the intersection of 151 and Water Street crossing there. Yes, that is a crossing. Okay, but it doesn't have any walk, does it? Doesn't have any what? Is there any walk light? No. No, no. No. It's just a speed limit question. This is just speed limit. Yeah. 
So we just have to run quick and make it across. That's why we're slow on the speed <laughs> down. There is, you can't have a crosswalk marked here because those are city, those are state uh, highways. The, the reason to pursue this no, 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 no. is the perception of danger oh, at the speeds they are. Um, I believe the request was to reduce it to help ease people's perception of danger so that the vehicular traffic is going slower because of the number of pedestrians that do use that area. And, and a point of clarification, this is a related conversation, but we know that it's a problem. I know that it's a problem, at least that there's no pedestrian facilities, like there's no crosswalk and lights at that intersection for water and business 151. Um, and I believe, wasn't it Dr. Fields at UW Platteville students ran a budget estimate. We could put pedestrian facilities in at that intersection and they found it would cost maybe 500,000 was the rough estimate. But that is something that we could do as a city. Um, and I think that that would be a really excellent thing to do because it's a very dangerous intersection. I believe it's because it's a state highway, you can't do that. We can. We can. What right, did you, Howard? What did you just say, Larry, about this? Yes. Well, back to my proposal here was to slow the traffic because of the potential for pedestrian accidents, but also for vehicle accidents. If you drive south, coming on business 151 and you reach the the egg um, the driveway for um, Dollar General there is absolutely no visibility so you make a right turn in there and it's extremely dangerous you might as well expect an accident the other thing is I my business is on the corner of uh, Ch South Chestnut and business 151 and the traffic coming, not only going up the hill, but going down the hill is pushing 50. Uh, and so therefore to slow down is major <coughs> difficult. So to start and having a slow, gradual decrease in uh, speed is a safety measure on this stretch of road in the city. The only thing I haven't heard anybody mention <coughs> is what the negative impact of this will be when you slow down traffic like that you can just it even more so and as you know that's the busiest intersection in Grant County okay you've got tons of traffic already backed up in there it's very difficult because of the traffic backing up to get in and out of Culver's the uh, Dunkin Donut so you slow people down you're gonna back them up even further Okay, the only way you can do that is if you change the, long, the length of the lights, but then you're going to back people up coming the other way. So you need to take that into consideration. I think in overlooking one thing here, um, it's the pedestrian safety that we're worried about. And that's why I think we're wanting to drop these back down to this 25 mile an hour on, especially down there by the Round Tree Bridge and up by the one by Novus, because there's a lot of people walk across there and it's really bad down there on the Uno's end of the area because of all the people walking across, going back to the dorms and what have you. So I think it's important that we drop this down to them 25 mile an hour speed limits just for safety's sake for the pedestrians. I'm not discounting that at all, Dick, whatsoever. I just wanted to bring it to your attention of what the other effects will be, just so I, you're aware of it. I've also noticed that in the past few years, you can go along that corridor and see new developments or properties that have been redeveloped. Uh, Pioneer Ford has moved out in that area. Uh, you've seen the two credit unions have gone up. Um, <clears throat> the new Culver's has a lot of traffic coming in and out of those driveways. Uh, anytime Fitness is now along there, Dunkin' Donuts has added traffic. Um, given the number of points of conflict with the traffic flow, uh, it seems as though it, you, you want to look at this as an issue and, and consider what, what your options are. Uh, I think naturally people will drive um, at a speed that they're comfortable, and if they don't perceive a danger, they might continue to go faster. Um, some of that is education, some of that is uh, alerting people to the change in speed limits, uh, and some of it, quite frankly, will be a little bit of enforcement. So um, I, 
I, I think if you decide you want to move forward with this, we'll want to make sure we give the public enough time to adjust to it. See, there, there's one on here that I would like to see change, but it's not. And that's the 40 mile an hour from East Side Road to yes, um, Evergreen to the city limit. Much like uh, Council Member Stockhausen brought this up, Council Member Bonin also brought up a different street. And uh, after discussing with staff, we decided we'd wait until this ordinance was passed and then look at Mr. Bonin's request as well. Um, there are, um, and, and in support of Mr. Bonin's request, I, I have talked to a few community groups who have also brought up the East Side Road as a speed limit issue uh, going too slow. So um, that'll all have to get worked yeah. out yet. Well, my point being is we have this uh, slower vehicle. I Neighborhood think. electric vehicle? Yes. And they can't get to the hospital because they cannot go on a 40 mile an hour street or highway. It's 35 and under. That's my biggest okay. part of it. In other words, you're supporting this change? East That's Side Road? George oh, Road. East Side Road, no. I'm no, it's not on here. I just, okay. Okay. I'm adding to the mess. Um, going back to a, a comment that was made about the stoplights, Howard, you've had discussions, I think, with the DOT about whether or not the stoplights at Water Street and Highway 151 could be change so that you could have crossing for pedestrians? I, the, I should say lighted signed crossing for pedestrians. Um, the, the DOT and the city of Platteville has a jurisdictional agreement that basically has that uh, the state is responsible for Highway 8081 coming in from the south all the way up to the south side of the intersection. The city of Platteville owns or is responsible for the intersection of Business 151 and 8081, and we also uh, are responsible for 80 and 81 through the city of Platteville. Um, we are responsible for business 151 from the city limits on the east side, which is basically the on off ramp uh, by Walmart and, and Uber Socks, all the way to the west city limits, which is um, the uh, boundary line between the apartment building and the H&R uh, Block business. Um, anything west or south, if you will, of that line is township or county jurisdiction and has to be approved by them. Well, this was my question because um, in the city we have a walk sign for 8081. And uh, why not down at uh, 151 and and 80 because the city is taking care of business 151 is that correct we got yes. it from the the city <laughs> to maintain it would yes. cost 500,000 to make those changes pardon to make to make appropriate changes to that intersection to allow for for full uh, pedestrian accommodations which would include uh, ADA accommodations it's estimated to cost roughly $500,000 in order to make the improvements necessary to do that. Uh, it's, not just, it's not just the signal lights. The signal lights are actually the, probably the lowest cost item uh, of all of that. The, the hard improvements are, are the actual um, uh, concrete walkways, sidewalks, and redoing the uh, little separator islands so that you could have ADA crossings through those through those separator median islands and and what we call pork chop islands uh, at the at the corners of of each of these intersections that's where the bulk of the uh, cost would be in in making that a fully accessible intersection that would be just sidewalks and stuff right there. 
That's nothing to do with anything going up or down the corridor, because I think Correct. was it last year we looked at that, and that was more like five million or something like that, to, <laughs> all the way out through there. I don't know if it was that high, but I remember I, having a discussion with the council on that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, didn't we talk yeah. to Delta Three or? Yep. Howard has an estimate. I I don't recall what that number was, but it was it was a significant number um, to do walks up and down that corridor but what we're saying is in order to make it accessible for just the intersection uh, it would be roughly half a million dollars is there any crosswalk uh, for example if I wanted to go to Culver's from from uh, Ellen Street is any crosswalk across 151 run like hell yeah, no, there's not. <laughs> there's nothing there. Uh, can no. you? Uh, some streets you there, can step there out is and say the, that you're crossing. What? Some streets you can step out here and say you're crossing because it is a crosswalk, even though it's not marked. Correct? There are. That's true. Under state streets. of Wisconsin law, there are marked and unmarked crosswalks, They're and unmarked. and have I would have to defer ones? to the attorney or or the police chief on on this, but I believe that. An unmarked crosswalk is basically the continuation of a sidewalk uh, through through a through an intersection. If you had if you have a sidewalk on the south side and a sidewalk on the north side of an intersection, even if it's not marked as a crosswalk, I believe that. Wisconsin law calls that an unmarked crosswalk and has certain laws and, and restrictions regarding that. But I would have to defer to, to either the attorney or the police chief on, on how that uh, impacts under state law. Okay. But in the case, for example, by any time fitness coming across there, the issue is that um, there is no continuation of sidewalk, no logical place for a person to go from one side of the intersection to the other. You would have you would have to create something there because there isn't there isn't a continuation of Virgin or Ellen to the south of Business 151. So it would be it would be legally problematic to say that there's a legal crosswalk there. Yeah, and much less terrifying. I make that cross not infrequently, and it's a horrible place to cross the street. It's just scary. If if we were to do this in a proper fashion, what we would what I would prefer to do is have the crosswalk at the signalized intersection there at 151 and and Water Street and encourage people to walk the block or block and a half down to that intersection cross with proper crosswalk lighting with proper ADA accessible crossings and then walk the block or block and a half on the other side to get to where they need to go. Um, we all know that people being people, they will probably try to take the shortest route available unless unless we make it more difficult for them uh, to do that so those those would be parts of design criteria when and if we decided to work on business 151 so at this time we're simply uh, considering the reduction of the speed limits correct and my I wanted to make a motion that the speed limits change oh do we need a business on information and discussion so no okay. motion this evening then you have so we have the information because my my request here was simply to slow the traffic down because of my experience every single day on the speed of traffic and the other thing that came to mind was as human beings we tend to go at least five miles over the speed limit no matter where you are no matter where you drive and if we got it down to 35 for instance that means people would generally go 40 if it was staying at 40, that means they're pushing 50 already. And I've experienced that. 
But I will also tell you one more thing that's happened since this uh, reached the newspapers. Today I watched very clearly that traffic is slowing down on the hill between McDonald's and my building. So it is helping a little bit to get the word out. All right. Next item, <clears throat> Grand County Highway Construction Aids. This is a standard annual uh, idea we put in $2,000, the county puts in $2,000, and then when we uh, complete our road project for the year, we uh, receive the full $4,000. Any questions on that? All right. Uh, we need a motion to go into closed session, and at the end of uh, the motion, the language here, would you also add and to go back into open session to adjourn? So someone oh. needs to please make that motion. Per Wisconsin Statutes 19.85, paren 1, paren C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, which is the city manager evaluation and employment contract. I move we go into closed session. And come to open session after. And come to open session after, thank you. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second, we'll vote. Nichols? Yes. Seabolt Wilson? Yes. Dan? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Bonin? Yeah. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. We'll have a five minute break here, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please. That should be the next time.